Hey, this is Michael Bohm with Youth Apologetics Training. Today we're going to keep going on this incredibly long series about Catholicism and what do they believe. Today we're going to continue talking about the Apocrypha. We started yesterday and today I'm going to conclude just giving you an idea of what is in the Apocrypha. What does it consist of? And uh, just kind of give you a quick overview. Anyway, let's jump in and learn more about the Apocrypha. Then we move on to the Epistle of Jeremiah, and uh, sometimes this is just printed as chapter 6 of Baruch, so it kind of just gets tacked on with Baruch. Now, this book, this, uh, or I'm sorry, this Epistle of Jeremiah, it's supposed to be a letter from Jeremiah during the exile in Babylon, and it's basically just a letter talking about pagan idolatry, speaking against it, and most people regard it as not written by Jeremiah, but rather a fake. Nonetheless, people generally date this book somewhere around 200 BC as well. Again, not during the exile, but long after the exile. So anyway, how about this song of the three holy children? Well, the Song of the Three Holy Children is a collection of uh, prayers and hymns that were apparently sung by Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego while they were in the fire uh, in the book of Daniel. You guys familiar with that story? King Nebuchadnezzar has these three boys thrown into the furnace because they wouldn't worship his idol. And so this song of the three holy children, doesn't sound Catholic at all, um, were thrown into this furnace and supposedly this book consists of the songs and prayers that they offered up while they were in there. Huh. Okay. What about the story of Susanna? This is interesting. This story of Susanna is also inserted into the book of Daniel, just like the previous song of the three holy children. And the story of Susanna, it's, it's about a woman named Susanna. And um, apparently she's a pretty good looking lady. And two perverted old guys try to uh, make sport of her. And when she refuses to comply to these perverted guys, the guys accuse her of committing adultery. And they, they, well, they lie, they give false testimony, and she's condemned in a council. But then Daniel steps in, Daniel the prophet steps in and exposes the two men. And, uh, well, somehow she is, she is vindicated and the guys get put to death. Kind of interesting. But again, they throw it into the book of Daniel. And then, just like the previous said two books, then we get to Bell and the Dragon, or rather the previous two writings. We have Bell and the Dragon. Um, this is also thrown into the book of Daniel. And it's two different stories. Uh, there's a story about Bell, and then there's a story about the dragon. The story of Bell is the name of an idol in, ba in Babylon. I'm sure you guys recognize that. And the story of Bell is basically Daniel is told to make offerings to this idol of Bell, and Daniel refuses. Well, he tells the king of Persia that the vain idol had no need of offerings because it could not eat anything. So the king has the priests of this idol go into the um, temple at night and they eat the food that's offered to the idol, trying to trick Daniel. I mean, kind of silly, but anyway. Um, Daniel ends up spreading some ashes on the floor in the temple in such a way that he busts them and figures out that it's actually the priests. And that's that story. Then we have the dragon. Okay, and this is another strange story. Daniel refuses to worship this actual living dragon. That's interesting. And he um, accepts a challenge to slay this dragon, but he's not allowed to use a, a sword or any kind of weapon. And so what he does is he uh, kills the dragon by feeding it pitch, fat, and hair. Kind of, I don't know, you kind of imagine him rolling this all up in a ball. And he feeds the dragon this ball of pitch, fat, and hair. 
and the dragon uh, bursts asunder, kind of explodes. Uh, you know, maybe the dragon can't digest hair, and it kind of gets down in his gut, and the dragon starts getting a lot of gas and kind of bursts. I don't know. Kind of weird, but there you go. There's that story. This, These two, the bell and the dragon uh, writings, were somewhere around 150 to 100 B.C., and yeah, like I said, they're inserted into the book of Daniel. Now, what about first and second Maccabees? Uh, first Maccabees, as far as a historical book goes, is fantastic reading. Again, don't, I'm not calling it scripture, but I am saying check it out. It's, it's, uh, it's a historical book, somewhere written somewhere around 100 B.C., and it covers the history of the Jews from about 175 to 135 B.C., and it's, it's kind of covering the story about the Jews living in Palestine and how they were fighting to gain uh, uh, independence from the Greek leadership. It really is a fun read, and it is inspiring. Um, in fact, historians regard this book as historical, the first, first Maccabees, okay? We haven't talked about second Maccabees yet, but first Maccabees, historians regard it as accurate. So, kind of fun read. Uh, anyway, second Maccabees, you would expect that it would be a sequel, but it's not. It's basically, it's a different account of some of the events of first Maccabees. And then there's a bunch of embellishments and, and uh, strange legendary additions and other stuff. There is a more of a religious feel to Second Maccabees. And there's a lot of Roman Catholic doctrines that get inserted into the Second Maccabees. And um, they, they actually launch some of their arguments for certain doctrines of the Roman Catholic Church from what you find in Second Maccabees. And tomorrow we'll talk about that. So that's it, guys. That is what these, um, the Apocrypha is about. And, well, you got the shrunk-down Michael Bone version. But I just want to mention this, and I will mention it again tomorrow. I want you guys to write down these six reasons why we should not consider the Apocrypha canonical, okay, part of the Bible. Right? There's six reasons, and there's a lot more reasons than this. But if you can memorize these six reasons, you can bust them out should you need to in your uh, conversations. So here, here you go. Get a pen, get a paper, and write these down. Uh, one, the Apocrypha, none of the books in this, none of the books in the Apocrypha claim to be inspired of God, okay? And that is interesting because nearly every book of the Bible in one form or another makes that claim, all right? Number two, there's no, there is no prophecy in the Apocrypha. There's no prophecy, and therefore there's no really any way to check to see if it's inspired of God. All right? Number three, nowhere in the New Testament is the Apocrypha quoted. Now, there's one disputed verse. We'll talk about that tomorrow. No big deal. But uh, if you will notice, and sooner or later we'll talk about this, the Old Testament is quoted repeatedly over and over and over, all the way throughout the New Testament. It is quoted and alluded to in so many ways that the New Testament writers confirm the Old Testament text, okay? How about this? Number four, there are historical errors throughout the Apocrypha, all right? Number five, there are unbiblical doctrines that are set forth in the Apocrypha, the Bible does not contradict itself. And when you find doctrines taught in the Apocrypha that clearly go against the teachings of the, the canon, the scripture that we recognize, that tells you that they don't belong. And six, um, it fails the test of canonicity. There were five tests that were applied to the Old Testament books of the Bible that illuminated the fact that these books were inspired of God and were to be included in the canon. And we'll talk about those five uh, tests tomorrow. Anyway, that is the Apocrypha 
in a nutshell and quickly why we should not accept it as scripture. Anyway, this is Michael Bohm, Youth Apologetics Training. Come out to the website and check it out. Say hi. I would love to talk to you guys and hook up with me on Facebook. I really do want to talk to you guys. I love you guys and I'll talk to you tomorrow.